Hi, I'm Wheeler Winston Dixon, James Ryan Professor of Film Studies at the University of Nebraska-Lincoln, and this is Frame by Frame. And I'd like to speak today about the great Hollywood moguls during the studio era of the 1940s and 50s. Uh, Harry Cohn, better known as White Fang or King Cohn at Columbia. Louis B. Mayer, who ran MGM, although he was a salaried employee for Lowe's Incorporated. Jack Warner, of course, head of production at Warner Brothers. Adolf Zucker at Paramount. Uh, Herbert J. Yates in Republic, and there were many more. The great Hollywood studio bosses of the 30s, 40s, and 50s uh, built up their empires. In some cases, uh, they just outright created their empires. Uh, David O. Selznick, of course, set up his own studio. Uh, Daryl F. Zanuck merged 20th Century and Fox in 1935 to create 20th Century Fox. And these were up from the bootstraps kind of filmmakers who were absolutely ruthless dictators who ran their studios like mythical kingdoms in which their word was absolute law, but they made some fabulous films along the way. And although they were utterly brutal in their business dealings on a daily basis, the films that they created just formed the absolute history of American cinema. The great studio bosses, more or less, their reign came to an end with the beginning of what's known as the Consent Decree in 1948, which basically forced them to give up their theaters. The Supreme Court ruled that they were in the business of making films, distributing films, and exhibiting films, and they had to give up one or the other because otherwise they were a monopoly. And so the studios sold off their theaters and stayed in the film production business. Also, the rise of television didn't help any as people were staying home. And at the same time, there was also the de Havilland decision in 1944, in which Olivia de Havilland successfully appealed to the Supreme Court of California that seven-year contracts to which the actors had been signed were seven years, and you couldn't just tack on endless extensions if you didn't want to do a picture, which is what the studios were doing. So from 1933 or so to about 1960, the studios reigned supreme and unquestioned. But now, studios are run by corporations, conglomerates, and by executives who only have two or three year tenures. And you really can't get much done at that time. You really can't get many pictures off the ground. You need a long time to develop films. And so by the time now that a film is green lit, and by the time it's released, often the people who put it into motion have been fired by the studio or have moved on. You need continuity, and this is something that all of these filmmakers had, these producers. They had personal vision. You know, Jack Warner's films at Warner Brothers were films about labor, films about social conditions, things like, I was a fugitive from a chain gang. You know. I was just wiping the sweat off my face. But I got it knocked off. But each of these people had a studio identity, which was really the producer's identity. And so the great moguls were the people who made these studios. I have a book uh, which is just coming out called Death of the Moguls, which is about this period in Hollywood in the 1950s. And interestingly, none of these producers had a succession plan in place because they all couldn't imagine a world in which they didn't exist. And when they died, their studios held into the hands of corporations where they are today. And so while the names of Warner Brothers and 20th Century Fox and Paramount and MGM continue on in Columbia and the other studios, the personal vision behind them is lost because they're now part of a large corporation. I'm Wheeler Winston Dixon, and this is Frame by Frame.